Good morning, dear students. Today we are going to solve May June 2016 one two paper. It's a MCQ paper, and the course we are studying is Physics 5054. Let's start. Okay, on your screen we have the first question. A student determines the circumference of a golf ball. Which instrument gives a reading that is the circumference of the ball, golf ball? Uh, for the circumference, you have to measure circular uh, in a circular manner. How much is the perimeter of that sphere? Um, for that purpose, the best thing will be a tape, so it can be wrapped around the circumference of a golf ball. So tape is the best option. So for question number one, P is the option. Okay, we are moving to next question. Question number two: A man pulls a sledge of mass 25 kg across level ground with a horizontal force of 60 newton. A constant force of friction of 20 newtons acts as the sledge. What is the acceleration of the sledge? So first of all, I know the applied force. That's 60 newton. I know the force of friction. That's 20 newton. So what we will do? We will, uh, from the applied force, we will subtract the frictional force, and we will get what is the resultant force. So 60 minus 20, it will be 40 newton. And then once I know the resultant force, then I will be able to find out what is the acceleration. I can apply the formula F is equal to m a. I know the resultant force. That's 40 newton. And I know the mass that's 25 kg, and then applying the formula F is equal to m a. 40 equals to 25 into a, and a will be 40 divided by 25, and the answer will be 1.6 meter per second square. The choice will be B. I have done this on a paper also on your screen. You can see. Yeah, resultant force is equal to 60 minus 20 equals to 40 newton. F is equal to m a. 40 equals to 25 into a, and a will be 40 divided by 25, and the answer will be 1.6 meter per second square. I hope you have understood the question number two. Okay, question number three is on your screen. A car moves in a circle at constant speed. What is the direction of the resultant force acting on the car? Because the car is moving in a circular path, and you know whenever an object moves in a circular path, the direction of the resultant force is always towards the center of the circle. So center of the circle is here. You see, the center of the circle is here. So the resultant force will be towards this center of the circle. So B is the right choice. So B is the direction of the resultant force acting on the car while the car is moving in a circular uh, track. So B is the choice. Okay, on your screen we have question number four: Which property of a body resists change from a state of rest or of motion? So the the property that the body resists the Change in any change in the state of motion, we call that property inertia, and inertia depends upon the mass of the body. The more the uh, mass, the more will be the inertia. Less the mass, the less will be the inertia. So here the answer could be inertia or it could be mass. So in question number four, you see the B option is mass, which is the correct option for question number four. B is the option. Okay, we reduce the size. Okay, question number five is on your screen. A brick is placed on a new meter and then on a beam balance. What is measured by each instrument? You know, you know the newton meter is used to measure the weight, and the beam balance is used to measure the mass. So newton meter measures weight and beam balance measures mass. So C looks the right option for question number five. C is the option. Question number six is on your screen. A uniform plank is pivoted at its midpoint. Two weights are added to the plank. One weight on each side of the pivot is in the position shown. A vertical force is applied at point X to balance the plank. 
what is the size and the direction of the force let me increase the size so i can explain to you okay so here we have a pivot here this force is of 8 newton this weight is 8 newton and this distance from the pivot is 2 meters so it will be trying to produce a clockwise moment and this clockwise moment is 8 into 2 16 so here i have a clockwise moment of 16 newton meter this for this weight here is 12 newton is the distance from the pivot is 2 meter so it's it is trying to produce an anti clockwise um, uh, uh, moment and that anti clockwise uh, moment is 12 newton into 2 meters it will be 24 newton meter so clearly you can see that the anti clockwise uh, moment is more as compared to the clockwise moment clockwise moment is only 16 newton meter while the anti clockwise turning uh, effect or moment is uh, 24 newton meter so here i have to, i am allowed to apply a third force and the first question is in which direction i should apply the for, uh, this force you see uh, because the clockwise uh, moment is smaller than the anti clockwise so this force which i will apply here should produce a clockwise moment now the question is how it will produce a clockwise moment if i apply this force in downward direction the force here on x if i apply it in downward direction then it will produce a anti clockwise moment which will not helping help us in balancing here i should apply the force in the upward direction so it will produce a, a moment in the clockwise uh, clockwise manner so i want a clockwise moment so the force applied on the x point should be in the upward direction you know for the body to be in equilibrium the sum of uh, clockwise moments should be equal to the sum of anti clockwise moments here two forces will be producing the clockwise moment this 8 newton and the force here so let me show you my working uh, here you see the clockwise moment uh, the clockwise moment should be equal to the anti-clockwise moment. The clockwise moment is being produced by two forces. One force is unknown and its distance from the pivot is 4 plus the 8 Newton force is distance from the pivot is 2. So the clockwise moment can be formed by 4, F multiplied 4 plus 8 multiplied 2 equals to anti-clockwise moment. The force is 12 Newton and the distance from the pivot is 2 meters. So 12 into 2. So we will have 4F into 16 is equal to 24 and 4F is equal to, uh, you see, by mistake here, I put a multiply sign, it's a positive sign. So when this plus 16 will go on the other side, it will be, it will subtract 24 minus 16 and the answer will be 8. So this 4 here multiplying when it will go on, this, on the other side, it will divide. So the answer is 2 Newton. So we will, at the point X, we will have to apply a force of 2 Newton in the upward direction. A little difficult question. And by mistake here, I have written multiply sign is a plus sign. Okay. So 2 Newton force in the upward direction. Let us to, uh, check the, what are the options available. The option available are 2 Newton force in the upward direction. That's the B choice. So for this question, B is the choice. Okay. So for question number six, B is the choice. Question number seven is on your screen. It says which quantity is a vector? Energy is a scalar, force is a vector. So B is the choice. B is the choice for question number seven. Question number eight is on your screen. Which process in the sun produces energy? On the sun, you know, we have small nucleus of hydrogen and they come close to each other and they join each other the nucleus of hydrogen and they form a helium nucleus and now large nucleus and it this process produces a lot of heat this process is called nuclear fusion nuclear fusion the nuclear fusion is the process which is happening on sun and other stars so c is the option question number eight c is the option Okay, question number nine is on your screen. You can see 
are 300 newton forces applied to a box to move it up a ramp as shown and uh, how much work is done by the force when moving the box from x to y you know from when you move the uh, box from x to y it's an inclined ramp we can calculate the work done if i know the applied force and i know the distance moved in the direction of the force i can calculate the work done by the formula f into d another way of finding the work done is if i know the vertical height gained by the body and i know the weight of the body that or or i know the mass of the body then i can calculate the increase in the gravitational potential energy and that will be equals to the work done but i don't know the mass i don't know the weight so i cannot apply that increase in the gravitational uh, potential energy formula so for the work done i know the applied force and i know the distance moved in the direction of the force so i will apply the formula work is equals to force into distance so 300 newton multiply 5 so the answer and the answer will be 1500 joules work done is equals to f into d f is 300 newton and the distance moved is 5 meter in the direction of the force so the work done will be equals to 1500 joules so c is the choice question number 9 c is the choice Okay, on your screen we have question number ten. Four beakers contain the same liquid. At which point is the pressure the greatest? Same liquid. The pressure of a liquid. The formula is rho g h, where rho is the density into g, where g is the gravitational field strength. We hope that these four beakers are on the same location, so they have the same g value. So the pressure now depends upon the h which means the depth of the liquid above the point at which you are trying to measure the pressure h stands for the depth of the liquid above the point where you are trying to find out the liquid pressure so at which point the so you see a above a there is no liquid b above b this much is the height of the liquid or depth of the liquid at c the depth of the liquid is this much and at d the depth of the liquid is this much so where is the depth of the liquid above the point greatest or largest in the point in the c in the c option the depth is the largest so here this liquid will be giving the greatest pressure so for 10 question the an answer is c for question number 10 the answer is c Okay, on your screen we have uh, question number eleven. Question number eleven is on your screen. It says a block of weight W rests on the side of area A. The gravitational field strength is G. What is the pressure exerted on the ground due to the block? The pressure is equals to force divided by contact area. In this case, the force is the weight. So the formula for the pressure will be weight divided by contact area. W divided by A, pressure is equals to weight divided by contact area. W divided by A, so B is the choice. Question number eleven, B is the choice. Okay, we are moving to the next question, and that question says. Uh, Water of depth ten meter exerts a pressure equals to atmospheric pressure. So one meter water, its pressure is equals to one atmospheric pressure. And air bubbles rises to the surface of a lake, which is two twenty meter deep. When the bubble reaches the surface, its volume is six point zero centimeter cube. What is the volume of the air bubble at the bottom of the lake? You see, the lake is twenty meter deep. Okay. so one atmospheric pressure is equals to the pressure of 20 meter deep water or 20 meter deep water's pressure is equals to one atmosphere so when the air bubble is at the surface of the lake we know it will be subject to only the atmospheric pressure so when the bubble is at the surface of the lake uh, its volume is given its volume was 6 cm cube and the pressure acting on it is one atmosphere but when that the same bubble will be at the bottom of the lake there will be a there will be atmospheric pressure one atmospheric pressure of the atmosphere plus 
there will be 20 meter deep water and one 10 meter deep water exerts a pressure of one atmosphere so 20 meter deep water will exert a pressure of two atmosphere so two atmosphere pressure is coming from uh, due to the water and one atmosphere pressure is due to the atmosphere itself so the total pressure at the bottom of the lake will be 2 plus 1 3 atmosphere so the pressure at the surface of the lake is one atmosphere and the pressure of the and the pressure at the bottom of the lake is three atmosphere the volume at the surface of the, the lake the, the volume of the air bubble is 6 cm cube the question is what is the volume of the air bubble at the bottom of the lake we have, suppose uh, we will uh, suppose that the temperature do not change then i can apply the formula p1 v1 equals to p2 v2 p1 v1 equals to p2 v2 and then i can calculate what is the let me show you my working also question number 12 on your screen i hope you can see p1 v1 equals to p2 v2 p1 is one atmosphere at the surface of the lake and the volume of the air bubble is six equals to p2 at the bottom of the lake the total pressure is three and what is the volume of the air bubble we don't know v2 is the question so take this three to the other side six divided by three and the answer will be two centimeter cube so v2 is two centimeter cube so for question number two two centimeter cube is the answer so a is the option a is the option question number 12. okay on your screen we have a gas in a container of fixed volume is heated so volume is fixed and we are talking about a gas and we heated it what happens to the molecules of the gas so when you will provide heat the molecules will start their temperature will rise their kinetic energy will rise so when kinetic energy rises it's a indication that the molecules are moving faster so the option is they collide less frequently no they expand no molecules never expand they move faster yes because you raise the temperature so they are now they will move faster they move further apart no that cannot be possible because the volume is constant so c is the choice they move faster c is the choice okay on your screen we have now question number 14 the diagram shows two liquid in glass thermometers p and q the thermometers are identical except that the Q has a capillary tube with a larger internal diameter than the P. So this Q, its diameter of the bore is larger. Here the bore is narrow, its diameter is less. You know that when the bore will be smaller, when the diameter of the bore or the capillary tube will be smaller, it will, be, it will become very sensitive. So P will be more sensitive. But when something becomes very sensitive, its range decreases. So the Q thermometer will have larger range and the P will have greater sensitivity. The Q will have larger range and the P will have greater sensitivity. So to me, it looks 14. C is the option, sir. C is the right option. Okay, now we have question number uh 15 is on your screen he says uh, a slice of bread is placed under a red hot electric grill, grill to make toast so you can see here the grill is here and uh, be, uh, under the grill he has placed a slice of bread how does heat energy reaches the bread so the heat energy will reach to the bread there are three methods first method is conduction air but you know between the grill and the slice of bread, we have air and air is a bad conductor of heat. So the heat is not reaching from the grill to the slice of bread by conduction. Another method of transferring heat is the process of convection. But the problem here is that the slice of bread is under the grill. So the, by the convection, the heat transfers upward it do not transfers downward so convection is also not involved then the third method is left and that method spreads the heat in all directions and it do not require medium that is the infrared radiation 
so from the grill the heat is reaching the slice of bread by the process of radiation only so d is the answer for question number 15 d is the answer here on your screen now we have question number 16 the diagram shows the inside of a refrigerator here you can see on the top we have a cooling unit when the refrigerator is first switched on what happens to the air near the cooling unit the air here which is near to the cooling unit it will cool down when the air will cool down its molecules will come close to each other and when they come close to each other their their volume uh, kind of decreases so what will happen their density increases so the air particles move close together and their density increases so for question number 16 to me it looks the d is the right option for question number 16 d is the right option okay on your screen we have question number uh 17 a water wave in a ripple tank refracts as it passes from deep water to shallow water what properties change as the wave refracts you see when the water will wave will enter from uh, deep water into shallow water what will happen its uh, speed will change the speed it will slow down its wavelength will change the wavelength will decrease but there will be no change in the frequency so what properties will change speed and wavelength so for question number 17 d looks the right option for question 17 d is the right option okay on your screen we have question number 18 the diagram shows light incident on a plane mirror so here you see this is the incident ray it's a plane mirror the angle between the incident ray and the normal is 40 degree and you know this uh, and this is called the angle of incidence so when the reflection will take place at the point q the angle of reflection is always equals to angle of incidence so angle of reflection will be also 40 degree and the another thing they are asking in the question is what is the line pq the pq line is called normal so angle of reflection will be 40 and the line pq is called the normal so to me it looks a is the choice question number 18 a is the right choice okay so on your screen we have question number 19 he says which length is the focal length of the lens shown in the diagram so focal length of the lens is the distance between the optical center and the principal focus so where is the principal principal focus you see this light ray which was parallel to the principal axis when it passed through the convex lens it refracts and then it passes through the optical uh, sorry the focal point on the principal axis so this is the uh, focal point and this is the optical center so distance between them is called uh, focal length so this b distance is basically equals to focal length so b is the choice question number 19 b is the choice okay on your a little bit tricky question uh, on your screen uh, question number 20 question number 20 is on your screen the rays of the light from a ray box passes through three lenses placed at position 1 and 2 and 3 you have to decide what is the nature of these lenses either they are converging or they are diverging so look at carefully here look at here let me increase the size so i can explain to you okay so look at here this this is the first lens here the first lens here so these rays were going in this way but this lens made them bend it inward so this lens tried to converge them this ray was going like this but this first lens what it did it deviated it towards the principal axis so this lens is trying to converge them it means that the first lens is a converging lens okay so now concentrate on the position number 2 we have a lens here so this light ray was going like this it bended it towards the principal axis 
this ray, ray, ray of light was going like this and this lands on the position number two try to bend it towards the principal axis so this lens on the position number two is also trying to converge the light. So position one is a converging lens, position two is a converging lens. Now try this third position. So these light rays were coming in this manner and when and this is the original path. But what happened? The lens bended them away from the, a little away from the principal axis. What happened here? Look at this ray. It was going in this direction. It bended them away from the principal axis. So here we have a diverging lens. If you will put a scale here, you see the original path of the light is this. So they are bended away. And if you put a scale here, you will see the original path is this. But the light has bended away from the principal axis. So this, uh, on position number three, we have a diverging lens. So position one converging, position two converging. Position three is diverging, converging, converging, diverging. To me, it looks the B is the right choice, converging, converging, diverging. So B is the right choice. For question number 20, B is the right choice. Okay. Question number, let me reduce the size and show you the whole question. Question number 20 is on your screen. We have decided that the position one is a converging lens, position two is a converging lens, and position three is a converging lens. It's little difficult. I have tried to explain to you how I came to know converging, converging, diverging, how I came to know. I hope that you have followed my instructions and explanation. Okay, on your screen, we have question number 21. Light passes from air into a glass gl block of glass as shown, which expression is equal to the refractive index of the glass. You see, when the light enters from air into the glass block, the angle of incidence is W and the angle of refraction is Y. You know the refractive index formula is sine I divided by sine R. Sine I divided by sine R. Here the angle of incidence is W. So the formula for the refractive index will be n equals to sine w divided by sine y. Sine w divided by sine y for question number 21, a is the right option, sir. Okay, on your screen we have the next question, question number 22. The sound waves travel through air. The lines in the diagram show the positions of layers of air at one particular time. Which distance shows the wavelength of the wave? The wavelength of the wave is equals to the horizontal distance between the centers of two adjacent rare fractions or between distance, horizontal distance between the centers of adjacent compressions. So here you see, look at this B. This is the center of a rare faction. And this is also the center of the adjacent ray fraction. And the distance between them will be equal to the wavelength. So B is the choice. For question number 22, B is the right choice. This is the wavelength. From the center of one compression to the center of the other adjacent compression. B is the right choice for question number 22. Okay, on your screen we have question number uh, 23. Four plotting compasses are placed near a bar magnet. You may ignore any effect of the Earth's magnetic field. One compass appears like this. Here, the needle is pointing downward. You know the magnetic compass needle always follow the lines of magnetic field on that location. You know, here we have a North Pole. So one magnetic line will go like this. One magnetic line will go and bend and it will go like this. One magnetic line will go like this. So where this magnetic compass could be put and it will have this orientation of the its needle. I think that if it is placed on the C position because here the magnetic lines will be going in downward. And then they will bend and they will go to the left from the D. So C is the right option. The needle of the magnetic compass always follow the magnetic field. It always follow the magnetic lines. 
and magnetic lines come out of north and they go into the south. So C is the choice for question number 23. Okay, on your screen we have question number 24. A polythene rod is rubbed with the cloth and the cloth becomes positively charged. Because the cloth has become positively charged, it means it has lost negative charges. It has lost electrons. Which statement describes the transfer of charge? Negative charges are transferred from the cloth to the polythene. That is the right answer. Question number 24A is the option. Okay, on your screen we have question number 25. A charge of 45 coulomb flows through an electric Appliance in three minutes. What is the average current in the appliance? You know that formula for the current is charge divided by time. The charge should be taken in coulombs, 45 coulombs given here, and the time should be taken in seconds, but the time given here is in minutes. So I will multiply it with 60 to convert it into seconds. So it will be, I have done this on a paper. Let me show you that. Okay. So question number 25 is on your screen. I is equals to Q by T, 45 coulomb divided by 3 minutes. I will convert into seconds. How? 3 multiply 60 and it will be converted into seconds. So it will be 45 divided by 180, 45 coulomb divided by 180 second. And the answer will be 0 0.25 amps. 0 0.25 amp. Question number 25, 0 0.25 amp. To me... It looks 0 0.25 amp. A is the choice. Question number 25. A is the choice. Okay, on your screen we have question number 26. How can 1 volt also be expressed? 1 volt is equal to the amount of energy given to units charge. Amount of energy given to unit charge. So it's 1 joules per coulomb. 1 joule per coulomb. That's the definition of the volt. So D is the option. Question number 26. D is the right option. Okay. Question number 27 is on your screen. The diagram shows a battery of three 1.5 volt cells. What is an advantage of this arrangement? You see here, the cells are connected parallel to each other. When you connect the cells in parallel to each other, their EMF do not add up. When you connect the cells in parallel, their EMF do not add up. But one good thing happens. That because now they share the load. That's why their life is more. One advantage in connecting the cells in parallel is their life is more. Another advantage of connecting the cells in parallel is that if one of them or two of them is stop working, the, the ones which are in good condition, they will continue providing the electric energy. So look at the choices. What is, the advantage, what is an advantage of this arrangement of cells? A is the battery can supply a current for a longer time than a single 1.5 volt cell. That is the right statement. So to me, A is the answer. B is the battery can supply an EMF between 0 volt and 4.5 volt. That's wrong. The battery supplies more energy to each coulomb of charge than a single 1.5 volt cell. That's wrong. The, M, the EMF of the battery is 4.5 volt. That is also wrong. So A is the choice. Question number 27, A is the choice. Okay, we are moving to the next question. The next question is on your screen. Question number 28, which diagram shows the arrangement of the ammeter and voltmeter to obtain readings to find the power of a lamp? To find the power of the lamp, I need two things. I need to know how much current is flowing through the filament lamp, and I need to know how much voltage drop is on the filament lamp. For this purpose, I need to connect an ammeter and a voltmeter. The ammeters are always connected in series with the filament lamp and the voltmeter should be connected parallel to the filament lamp. To me, B looks the right choice. Question number 28, B is the right arrangement. The voltmeter is parallel to the filament lamp and the ammeter is connected to the in series with the filament lamp. So you will be able to, from the ammeter, you will be able to find out the current and from volt voltmeter, you will be able to find out the 
voltage drop across the lamp and then you can calculate the power the formula for the power is p equals to iv so b is the right option sir 28 b is the right option the rest of the options are wrong okay on your screen we have question number <clears throat> Question number 29 is on your screen. A 6 volt battery is connected to a network containing five identical resistors. A voltmeter has one lead connected to point K as shown. You see, when you have connected the voltmeters one and on point K, it's like connecting the voltmeter to the positive terminal of the battery. Because from the positive terminal of the battery till the point K, there is no resistance. So there is no voltage drop. So K is like you have connected the voltmeter to the positive terminal of the battery. At which point should lead L be connected so that the voltmeter reads 3 volt. Try to understand what I am trying to tell you. You see here are, we have two branches. Like one, here I have a branch and here this branch. These two branches are parallel to each other plus they are parallel to the battery. So the things which are parallel to each other, they have the same voltage. So the voltage drop on this whole branch will be 6 volt. And the voltage drop on this branch will be also 6 volt. But here you see we have two resistors, identical resistors. So on this whole branch, there will be a voltage drop of 6. But because these two on, in this branch are connected in series, so this first one will take 3 volt and this will take 3 volt. In this second branch, the voltage drop across the whole branch will be 6 volt. But here you see inside the branch, we have three resistors, identical resistors connected in series with each other. So that 6 volt will be divided on these three. It will take 2 volt, it will take 2 volt, it will take 2 volt. The question they are asking is where should I, I connect the, the, uh, the L end of the voltmeter? So that the voltmeter will read 3 volts. So who is taking the 3 volt? The resistor A. So put the, this, uh, this movable contact on point A. So because the A will be, uh, there is a 3 volt potential drop. So the reading on the voltmeter will be 3. So put the L on position A. It's a little tricky question. So A is the answer. Question number 29, A is the right option. I hope that you have understood. Okay. Question number question number 30 on your screen. The diagram shows the wiring of a three-pin mains plug. There's an error in the in the diagram. You see these three wires, they are exposed. And this outer covering is not on these three wires and, and they are under the, the cord grip. This should not happen. This insulation, the top insulation over the three separate wires, it should be under this cord grip. So this is the mistake. So the question is, what is the error? The cable cover C is not under the clip S. That is true. This is the main error there. So for question number 30, A is the choice. <coughs> the rest of the choices, the earth wire E is connected to the wrong terminal. No. The fuse F is connected to a live wire. It should be connected to a live wire. The live wire L is connected to the wrong end of the fuse. That's wrong. So A is the right choice. sir. Okay, on your screen, we have question number uh, 31. Question number 31 says, a uh, 100, 100 watt lamp is switched on for 5 hours each day for 3 weeks. The cost of 1 unit of electricity is 0 0.24 watt, uh, 224 dollars. How much does it cost to run the lamp for this time? You know, we can calculate how much is the cost for the energy, electric energy especially. The formula is power into time into the price of 1 unit. Power multiply time into the price of one unit. But in this formula, we have to take care that the power should be in kilowatts. But the power given to us is in watts. So how I will convert into kilowatts? I will divide it with 1,000. 
So 100 watt divided by 1000. So it will be converted into kilowatts. The time must be taken in hours. The time is already given in hours. He says five hours each day. But how much in three weeks? How much? So every week has seven days. Each day five hours. So it will be five into seven and three weeks multiply three. Five multiply seven multiply three. So this will give you the time in hours and price of the electricity is 0.24 per unit. So just do this calculation. I have done this on a paper. Let me show you my calculation. On your screen, you can see question number 31. Cost is equal to power into time into the price. The power is 100 watt to convert it into kilowatts. I have divided it with 1000. Then multiply with 5, multiply 7, multiply 3, multiply 0 0.24. The answer will be 2.52 dollar. 5 point, sorry, 2.52 dollar will be the answer. So 2.52 dollar C is the choice for question number 31. For question number 31, C is the right option. Okay, on your screen, we have the next question. That question is, uh, okay, question number 32, the diagram shows a simple DC motor. The switch is closed and the coil rotates. What change makes the coil rotate in opposite direction and at a faster rate? If you want to move the coil in opposite direction, you can do two, two things. One thing is you can do, you can reverse the magnetic poles. For example, the north is on the left and the south is on the right. You can switch their location. Put the south on the left and the north on the right. So you can do either this thing that you, you reverse the magnetic field or you can do another thing, you can reverse the direction of the current. You cannot do both the thing. You have to do only one thing to change the direction of rotation. Either reverse the polarity of the magnets or change the direction of the current. You do one thing only, okay? Not both the things at the same, at the same time. And to make it go faster, you can either use the stronger magnets or you can give provide the larger amount of current or you can increase the number of turns of the coil which change makes the coil rotate in opposite direction at a faster rate a choice is increase the current in the coil and increase the number of turns in the coil it will only increase the speed reverse both the magnetic field and current in the coil you cannot reverse both of them at the same time you cannot reverse the magnetic field and also reverse the current that will give you no uh, no benefit. Reverse the magnetic field and decrease the current in the coil. No. Reversing the magnetic field is the right thing, but decreasing the current in the coil will make your motor slow. Reverse D choice is reverse the magnetic field and increase the current in the coil. That is the right choice. Reverse the magnetic field and reverse the uh, sorry, uh, reverse the magnetic field and increase the current in the coil. That is the D choice. So for question number 32, the correct option is D. D is the right option. Okay, question number 33 is on your screen. The diagram shows a wire PQ between the north pole and the south pole of a magnet. There is a current in the wire in the direction of the arrow. Which What is the direction of the force on the wire PQ? You can apply Newton's left hand, uh, Fleming's left hand rule. Sorry, I said Newton. Fleming's left hand rule. Take your left hand, kindly don't go after the video. Take your uh, left hand, stretch the fingers of the left hand in this manner. You see the left, stretch the fingers of the left hand in this manner so that the thumb, the index finger and the middle finger, they are perpendicular to each other. This, the coding is FMC, FMC, force, magnetic field, current, force, magnetic field, current. The thumb is in the direction of the force. The index finger is in the direction of the magnetic field. And this middle finger is in the direction of the current. So the current is going from left to right. The magnetic field is going to the towards the bottom of the page. And my thumb points into the screen. My thumb is pointing into the page. It means that the force experienced by this force will be into the page. So we have used the left-hand rule. Please uh, use it actually. 
uh, stretch the fingers of the left hand and apply that left hand right left hand formula on this situation and find what is the direction of the force on that conductor it will be into the page so for question number 33 a is the option question number 33 a is the right option question number 34 electrical power is transmitted by cables over long distances at very high voltage what are the effects of using a high voltage transmission system you see when we want to transmit electricity to very long distances we use a step up transformer and we increase the voltage to a very high value why we do this by doing so we reduce the amount of current by reducing the amount of current we are able to reduce the energy losses power losses in the transmission lines so why we have increased the voltage because the power loss in the transmission lines is made low and the current in the cables is also made low. So D is the option. Question number 34. D is the right option. Okay. Question number uh, 35. Question number 35 is on your screen. The diagram represents harmonic emission from a metal filament. And... Uh, here we have a metal filament and it's hot and electrons are given out. We call it thermonic emission. And here we have a charged plate. It is positive. It's a node and it is at very high voltage. So what it do because the electrons are negative and this is positive. So what it will do, it will attract the electrons and the electrons. We call that electrostatic force of attraction. The force of attraction between negative charged electrons and the positive charge uh, a node that is called electrostatic force of attraction between the opposite charges and the electrons will be accelerated the particles attracted by a charge plate which will show the charge on the plate and the temperature of the metal filament for the process of the thermonic emission the metal filament should be very high its temperature should be high and the charge on the plate to attract the electrons should be positive. Positive charge on the plate should be positive. Temperature of the metal, metal filament should be high. So C is the choice. Question number. Uh, question number. We have uh, question number 35. Uh, C is the choice. Question number 35. C is the choice. Okay, everybody, we are moving to the question number 36. A potential divider is connected across the terminals of a 6-volt supply. When R is adjusted to 6 ohm, the voltmeter readings V1 and V2 are equal. If this is also adjusted at 6 ohm, the voltage will be divided equally between these two. V1 will be uh, 3 volt and V2 will be also 3 volt. Equal voltage drop on both. What happens to the reading when the resistance of R is then increased? If you will increase that resistance, you make it more than 3 ohm. So what will happen when its resistance will increase? The voltage drop here will increase. So V2 reading will be more and the voltage drop here will decrease. So V1 reading will be less and V2 reading will be more. So V1 decrease and the V2 increase. To me, it looks B is the option. Question number 36, B is the option. 36, B is the right option. Okay, on your screen, uh, I hope you can see question number 37. Which nucleus is produced when americium-241, whose formula is AM95241, emits an alpha particle? When you see when an alpha particle is... Uh, given out when an alpha particle decays the daughter nucleus will have a proton number two less uh, is proton proton number of the daughter nucleus will be two less and its mass number will be four less so if uh, proton number of the americium was 95 so if you reduce it by two the new the daughter nucleus should have a proton number of 93 and its mass number should be uh, four less than the mass number of the parent nucleus. The parent nucleus mass number is 241. So if you reduce it by four, 
the answer will be 237 so the proton number should be 93 and the mass number or nucleon number should be 237 so for question number 37 a is the right option for question number 37 a is the right option Okay, on your screen, we have question number uh, 38, which states the three types of radiation emitted by radioactive isotopes in order of their ionizing effect from highest to lowest. You know, the highest ionizing effect, alpha particles, then moderate ionizing effect is beta particles, and the lowest ionizing effect is gamma rays. So he wants you to put them in order from highest to lowest. So alpha, beta, gamma. Alpha, beta, gamma. For 38, A looks the right option, sir. Alpha has the highest ionizing power. Beta has the second highest ionizing power. And the gamma has the third highest ionizing effect. So A is the option for question number 38. Question number 39 is on your screen. He says, uh, let me increase the size. Okay, question number 39 is on your screen. It says, uh, which statement about the half-life of radioactive isotope is correct? Half-life change, changes as the isotope decays? No. Half-life is the time it takes for the nucleon number two of the isotope to have? No. Half-life is half the time it takes for the number of nuclei of the isotope to decrease to zero? No, 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 not decrease to zero. D is half-life is the time it takes for the number of nuclei of the isotope to decrease by half. Yes, this is the right definition. This is the exact definition of the half-life. Half-life is the time it takes for the number of nuclei of the isotope to decrease by half. So D is the option. Question number 39, D is the right option, sir. Okay, on your screen we have uh, question number 40, and it says the diagram represents the nuclei of three atoms. So here we have the key, the black dots or black balls are protons and the white balls are neutrons. So this has two protons, two neutrons. It has three protons, two neutrons. It has two protons, three neutrons. So which are the isotopes of the same element? The nucleus who has the same number of protons, the atoms which have the same number of protons in their nucleus, but different number of neutrons. They are the isotopes of the, an atom. So P has two protons, R also has the two protons. So, and the P has two neutrons, but the R has three neutrons. So P and R are the isotopes of each other. P and R only. So for question number 40, B is the right option. So we are done with this paper. I hope, dear students, that uh, um, the concepts of this paper are clear to you. This was uh, uh, summer 2016, 1-2 paper. It's an MCQ paper, and the course we are studying is Physics 5054. I hope that if you are watching these videos and this will improve your answering skills and it will improve your grades so thank you very much everybody have a good day and god bless you all thank you very